Welcome the Holy Trinity downtown on a beautiful summer day. Go ahead and find a seat. Try to remember the name of the person you were just talking to so that after the service you're not embarrassed, okay? Welcome again to Holy Trinity. It's a beautiful day in Chicago. And if you're new to the city of Chicago, then make sure you, like, bottle up the warmth of this day and store it up because in February it gets really cold, but it's possible to just store up the beauty and the memory of what, what a day like today is. The idea of a call to worship is that we're calling ourselves to remember how worthy God is. So worship could literally be understood as worthship, giving God what he is due because he is worthy. And uh, I'm just going to read a little snippet of a psalm from Psalm 113 that gives us the duration of when we should be praising God. So here, when we should be praising God from Psalm 113, here's what it says. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, from the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. That doesn't mean you always feel like praising God, but I hope the voices of other people around you today lift your spirits and cause, cause you to set your eyes upon the throne. One more word from Psalm 113 on why we should praise and listen to what he does. Who is like the Lord our God? He raises up the poor from the dust, lifts the needy from the ash heap, and makes them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. Part of what the gospel does in Christ is take us from the poverty of our sins and sit us with seat us with the lordship of Christ the prince of all and give us a kind of a undeserved royalty and riches of his presence we bow with me in prayer father in heaven thank you for this morning thank you for the sunshine thank you for uh, the other people around us and we pray as we come together that we would experience as uh, the New Testament expresses the presence of the people of God, the presence of the Spirit of God in the people of God as we lift our voices to you. We pray that we would praise you this morning from the rising of the sun to its setting. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us as we worship together this morning?
that you've done for me.
Will you pray with me? God, we come to you this morning and we praise you, Father, because you are completely worthy of our adoration. God, would you help our hearts worship you for who you are and what you've done. Let our ears be attentive. God, and let our eyes see you, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to continue our worship by stating the words of the Apostles' Creed. And this is just a way um, that we are adoring and proclaiming who our triune God is, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So if this is your first time hearing the Apostles' Creed, I just want to encourage you to listen to these words and just open your heart to continue to worship him. But Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand. Now I want you to take a couple minutes and I want you to ask your neighbor, what's been the highlight of your summer so far?
Good morning. Good morning again. It was, yeah. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to Holy Trinity Church. Let me invite you to begin to grab your seats again. I'll invite you to pick up your conversations uh, after the service. As you're beginning to take your seats, you can pull out the bulletin. Uh, if you have a hard copy of the bulletin, there's a couple of announcements I'm gonna draw our attention to, or if you need the digital bulletin, you can scan one of the QR codes around the room. Uh, but welcome again to Holy Trinity Church. I'm Sully, I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and we are in uh, the full summer mode. Uh, today marks the beginning of a bit of a new summer schedule for us as a church. Uh, congratulations for you all to remembering uh, that today's services, uh, service started at 10.30. Um, if you're just, just now arriving for the 11 a.m., uh, welcome. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, next week, plan on coming a little bit early uh, and joining us at 10.30. Uh, we're going to be doing one service through uh, July and August uh, for the next uh, two months or so together. And it's fun to be in a room full, packed, uh, together to worship. This is really a family event, a family affair. And so we actually also are going to be inviting our children into the service uh, for the month of July. Uh, so I just want to say a special welcome to all the kids who are here with us and who are going to be joining us through the whole uh, service today. Uh, just to draw your attention to the fact that we have a couple of activities for you uh, back in the back of the room. If you didn't pick up one of those on your way in, feel free to go grab it at any point throughout the service. Uh, also, a quick note about our summer rhythms here at uh, Holy Trinity Church. We have a bit of a, a habit or rhythm. Uh, for a couple of weeks during the summer, I've mentioned this before, but we allow our senior pastor, Pastor John, a couple of weeks out of the pulpit uh, for rest, for reading, writing, preparation for future sermon series. And so uh, today we have the opportunity to hear from one of our pastoral residents who will be preaching for us. So we have that to look forward to. A couple of things, so just two, two actual things I want to announce uh, that are in your bulletin that you can find out more about, uh, but I just want to highlight. The first is for the men. Uh, this coming Wednesday, uh, we have our second uh, BBC uh, Beers, Brats, and Chips, uh, kind of a, pick a picnic for us to get together, hang out, get to know one another. Uh, this coming Wednesday, it's going to happen at 6.30 at Pastor John's house. Uh, his address, we have posted it on social media, on our Instagram, it'll be on our website uh, if you need to find that. But we just invite you to come join us for an evening of hanging out and getting to know one another. Uh, Lastly, I just want to say a special welcome to all of you who are new or visiting with us. Maybe you've just moved to Chicago uh, this summer and uh, you're, you're maybe looking for community. Uh, we're so glad that you're here. We actually would love if you could fill out our Get Connected uh, card. It's actually a part of the, the bulletin uh, or you can fill it out on the digital bulletin. Uh, it allows us to get to know you and I'll follow up with you a little bit later on. Uh, but I also would invite you to mark your calendars for September 8th and 9th. I know that's a little ways uh, down the road, uh, but each year we host a, a, a little getaway that we call Vision Bus. And it's an opportunity to just get out of the city for a little bit, uh, spend 24 hours with others, really uh, asking what does the Lord have in store for you, uh, getting to know others here at Holy Trinity Church. Uh, so we just invite you to mark your calendars. We have a, a, a little save the date card that if you want to pick up at our welcome table after the service, uh, you can put that on your refrigerator or hang on to it uh, and mark your calendars for September 8th and 9th. Uh, those are all of the announcements that I wanted to draw our attention to today. I'm going to welcome forward Christian, who's going to lead us in our congregational prayer at this time. Let's pray. A reading from Psalm 89. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are the people who know the festal shout, who walk, O Lord, in the light of your face, who exalt in your name all the day, and in your righteousness are exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. By your favor, our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Lord, we are so thankful that our foundation is in you, who is worthy of our worship. We are thankful that we can come here to give everything to you, and we are amazed that you enjoy these times from a broken people like us. Father, we thank you for placing us here in Chicago to love those around us, and that your heart for the city is unrivaled. Lord, we thank you for the example uh, to serve and to love others shown in your life, death, and resurrection. We worship the resurrected Christ this morning. What a joy it is. But Lord, we confess that our sins still give us a blurred vision of you. 
We confess that we have taken the dissatisfaction of this world and try to satisfy these things with our own efforts. We often find that these things leave us empty, but we still pursue things such as our careers, money, family, possessions, pride, and many other things. We failed to find fulfillment in you alone. So Lord, we now look into our own hearts and take some time to humbly confess those sins that draw our hearts and turn from our ways and from your ways, O oh God. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Lord, may we remember that you've lavished the riches of your grace upon us for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, in whom all of our debts were paid. Lord, we pray that others may know of this longing of your heart, this longing that wants to forgive us. May you reveal yourself as a loving God to those who may feel unlovable and unloved and make known your heart to them and desire to forgive those who confess before you. May they see freedom and forgiveness and may the weight of sin be cast off uh, those shackled by the grips of it. Not only do you see our need for repentance and forgiveness, but you also see the very real practical needs individually and for the church. So Lord, we, we pray for the marriages coming up this summer. We pray for Evan and Emily, Seth and Suthi, Susie, Sam and Lisa. May you continue to give them grace as they prepare for this amazing gift and covenant of marriage. We pray for those who are single, wondering when you are going to answer them and providing them with a spouse. Would you give them patience and, and a heart to long for you first? We pray for the marriages here that are struggling. May you pour your grace upon them and may they bring their marriage before the foot of the cross. We also lift up the re-engaged marriage ministry. We pray for the, the lakes and the Fentons that you would provide them wisdom to build up the marriages here at HTC, HTC as they start up this fall. May all marriages reflect your love for the church, O oh Lord. Lord, we also pray for HTC and the many summer ministries. May the women's Bible study in the book of Job continue to be a powerful tool for women to get together to dig into your word and fellowship with others. We pray for the men in this congregation and the Bible studies going on. May you continue to shape the men in this congregation to long for you. We pray for the Summer Institute of Faith and Work. May you continue to equip those who are in this class to see the gospel in everything they do. We pray for the crew missionaries who are here at HTC this summer. We pray that you would sharpen their minds but soften their hearts as they train under your word. We pray for a continued fellowship with Nueva Vida Church in Havana, Cuba. We pray for a continued renewal and strengthening in the pastors and believers' hearts there. Lord, we pray for our children here who will join us this summer. May our times of family worship be nourishing to all of us. And God, we pray for those who are here for summer internships. May you work in their hearts as they seek you in their professional lives. May you give them vision for the future. And Lord, we, we pray for David this morning as he brings your word. May these words challenge us today, and may your gospel be known. And in the precious name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Now, I would like to invite all the children in Kid City to just gather up to the front. Uh, we have a special message for you. Anyone who considers themselves a child of God is welcome to come sit <laughs> at the front. It's okay, you can come right here. You can all sit down. Wow. We have some camels for you. Anybody know what a camel is? See this? A camel, that is right. What is this right here? It is. There are two humps on the camels. Camel has two humps. This one does. How are you kids doing? Doing good? Doing good, yes? I have a one question for you before we get started, okay? All right, I'm going to ask you this question. How did you get to church this morning? You walked, okay. You drove, okay, so in your car. 
car? Anybody take a train? No trains this morning, just shoes and cars. That is awesome. There's lots of different ways to travel from place to place, okay? And today I'm going to be sharing a story about this worker who traveled far. And do you want to guess what this worker used to travel? I'm going to give you a hint. There you go. A camel. Can everybody say camel? Good job. All right. Well, this amazing story I'm going to share with you, it has a, a man named Abraham. Have you guys been hearing about Abraham? You got, yes, okay. No, not Abraham Lincoln, but uh, another, another good Abraham. Um, he, uh, Isaac, his son, Abraham's worker, and then Rebecca, and then it also includes, what is this? A camel. Lots of camels, actually. All right, someone share. Abraham wanted to find a special wife for Isaac who loved God just like their family did. So he sent someone to help find this special woman, okay? It was Abraham's worker who went to go find a wife for Isaac, Abraham's son. While on his journey, Abraham's worker rode a, a camel. That's right. So before cars and, you know, people used to actually ride in carriages, some horses, donkeys, Abraham's worker rode a camel. There you go. I'm sure it was hot. And I am sure he and the camel were tired and thirsty. What do you usually want when you were outside and it was hot? Water. That is right. Well, this is all a big deal. So Abraham's worker needed help. All right. So he prayed to God and he asked for guidance, just like we would ask our parents. He asked God if any lady would come offer him and his camels water, he would know that she is the right wife for Isaac. When he arrived at a well of water, he met a kind and beautiful woman named Rebecca. Can you guess what happened? She gave water. Good job. That's right. She showed love for God by offering water to Abraham's worker and even being kind to the camels. Can you imagine how much water those camels needed? It was probably a lot. It was a big task. But Rebecca's love for God made her show love and kindness to the camels too. And Abraham's worker knew she was the right wife for Isaac. So he thanked God. He gave her gifts and asked if she would marry Isaac. Rebecca said yes. And her family said yes too. And so Rebecca's family sent her off with Abraham's worker, and they all blessed her on the journey, okay? And they traveled back to Isaac together with the camels, and then Isaac and Rebekah got married. Isn't that a cool story? Yeah, I know. Here are a few things. Do you guys remember that God gave Abraham lots of promises? Who remembers that, they, that Abraham gave, that God gave Abraham lots of promises? Yeah? Well, this story reminds us that God keeps his promises even to Abraham's kids. And he keeps his promises even to you. Just like he promised to bless Abraham's family, he guided the worker to find the perfect wife for Isaac, right? And God cares about our families. He cares about our friends and our relationships. And when we trust him and follow his plans, he leads us to the right people who bring us joy, love, and a deeper connection with him, okay? The second thing is just like Rebecca's love for God made her show kindness to the camels, our love for God can lead us to show kindness to others, okay? And the last thing I want to share with you guys is that there's also another father who sent a worker, except he wasn't just a worker, he was his own son, and he made it possible for us to have a relationship with him. And just as God guided Abraham's worker to find the perfect wife for Isaac, he also guides us to find a deep and loving relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing, you guys. I want to pray for you, and I hope that you really enjoyed this story. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for the story of Abraham, Isaac, Rebecca, and Abraham's worker. Help us trust in your plan and seek your guidance in our relationships. We know you keep your promises and you are faithful. May our love for you lead us to show kindness and love to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You can go back to your seats now, okay?
Amen. Let's stand as we continue in worship this morning. Today's scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 24, and um, contrary to what the printed bulletins say, uh, we will be reading verses 1 to 28. 
If you have uh, one of the blue Bibles, that can be found on page 17. If you have one of the scripture journals, that can be found on page 94. Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh, that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Abraham said to him, see to it that you do not take my son back there. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land, he will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife for my son from there. But, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be free from this oath of mine. Only you must not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. She went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw water for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water, and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, Please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, We have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsman. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Well, good morning. I want to invite all the adults now to come sit here in the front for the main servant. <laughs> Um, no, if you have your Bible, would you keep it open to Genesis chapter 24? Uh, my name's David. I'd love to get the chance to meet you if I haven't yet. I'm a pastoral resident here at Holy Trinity Church. Um, I, I lead the youth ministry, get to hang out with our teenagers every week, which I enjoy. Um, and I'm thankful for chances like this when I'm able to preach. Um, and, and as a pastoral resident, I also do a mix of what you might call other duties as assigned. Um, I know some of you have had some jobs with some other duties as assigned here or there. And part of what this has looked like for me in the past few months 
has been covering a variety of tasks that have come up as different people on our team here at the church have been out for maternity leave or paternity leave in the past few months. Um, I haven't been here too long. I've been here about nine months, and in that time we've had five different people on our team who've been out at different times as they're welcoming new children into the home, uh, which has been great and has given me all sorts of opportunities for other duties to be assigned. Um, but, but when you're training someone for a new role, or, or you're being trained for a new role, right, you want to make sure that they have everything that they need for when you're gone. Maybe that's something that you've had to do before. Uh, whether you're just going on vacation or, or you're stepping out of a role and, and need to train up your replacement, uh, or e even parents, you're, you're getting ready to go out for the night and you're leaving your kids with a babysitter. You got to prep them, you got to train them to cover things while you're gone. Uh, when you're doing this kind of thing, when someone else is getting ready to take things over for you, you want to make sure that you've done everything that you can to prepare them well for when you're gone to make sure that they have everything that they need. And in our text of scripture today, that's really the situation that Abraham is in. We're coming to the end of our series in the life of Abraham through Genesis, and Abraham is getting to the end of his life, and he's making sure that his son Isaac has what he needs for when he's gone. He wants to make sure that he's passing things off well. But, but there's a problem, there's a challenge here. And, and that's really that what Isaac needs is a lot less of anything that Abraham can actually help with. And, and a lot more, Isaac needs to see if God, who, who's shown this kindness and, and provided for his father Abraham, Isaac needs to see if this God is going to do the same thing for him. That's what Isaac needs to see in this moment to see if God will continue these promises of blessing that he's made. Really the main theme that I want us to see from this text today is the loyalty of God in the next generation of promise. The loyalty of God in the next generation of promise. Because that's the main question that this text is concerned with. Can God be expected to fulfill his promises? And in particular, can he be expected to fulfill his promises even to the next generation? Even in the face of transition, in the face of whatever new challenges might come up. And so I want to invite you today, if you're facing transition or you're facing challenge, I want to invite you to consider as we look at this text to ask, can God be trusted with what I'm facing? Can God be trusted with what I'm facing? Our, our chapter is a fairly long chapter. It's 67 verses, uh, but it's a story. It keeps moving along, and, and we'll look at it in, in really three scenes. First, we get a mission in verses 1 to 9, then a meeting in verses 10 to 28, and then finally a marriage in 29 to 67. So would you pray with me as we enter into this time in this text? Father God, we pray that you would speak through your word. We believe that your word has power, that, that it matters for our lives today. And, and so would you guide this time in our word? Would you speak through me and, and help us all to hear what it is that you have to say through your holy word? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the, the first scene in this text, these first few verses, we see that Abraham sends his servant on a mission, a mission. And the main idea that we really see in these first few verses is that the family of God will repeatedly face a new generation of challenges. So look at verse 1 with me. It says, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham is he's getting to the end of his life, and God has blessed him just like he said he would. He's been fulfilling the promises that he made in his covenant with him. We've seen throughout the life of Abraham, God's given abundance. He's blessed those who bless Abraham and cursed those who curse him. And most miraculously, he's given him a son. In his old age, in his wife's old age, he's blessed them with this son, Isaac. But if you, if you look back and remember God's original promises, his covenant with Abraham, the promises were even bigger than that. And those promises 
haven't really happened yet. Abraham isn't a great nation at this point. He doesn't really have any land to his name. Um, he, he doesn't have numerous descendants. He hasn't become a blessing to all nations. And, and so the hope with this promise is really getting ready to be passed off to Isaac. But there's still all sorts of challenges. For this line of promise to continue, somehow Isaac needs to find a wife. But he needs to find a wife without either just assimilating into the surrounding pagan culture in Canaan or just giving up and going back to their home country, abandoning this land that God promised. So somehow he needs to find a wife while avoiding these pitfalls. And so we see this transition in this text to a new generation of challenges. God has provided Abraham with a son. Will he now provide for that son? Right? Maybe God showed up when you prayed and asked for a child, but now that child's all grown up. They're even looking for a spouse. Is God still going to take care of them? When they grow up, when they're, they're off to school, they're out of the house, is God still going to take care care of them in the face of new challenges, new challenges. Sometimes it feels like you grow up and the challenges of life grow up with you, right? Will God provide for his people as they face each new generation of challenges? Our, our society, often in, in moments where there's a lot of generational shift or transition, it feels like there's lots of stories, lots of articles coming out about the new challenges that come with that or, or the decline of Christianity in the West, right? Young people leaving the church. In the midst of cultural shifts and new challenges, political tensions, as we, as the family of God faces these things, it can be easy to feel like we, we don't have a playbook for this. We don't know what to do in the face of these new things. And so the questions of this text really have relevance for us. Will God provide, or is he caught off guard by all of this too? Is all, all these new things that are happening, does he know what to do about it? That, that's the questions that these texts raises. And so with that in mind, Abraham, he gives his servant a job to do. He gives him a mission, the mission that we see in this first scene, to go back to his people, the land that he came from, and find a wife for his son who's willing to come to the land of Canaan. She needs to be able to, to go there. We're not looking for a long-distance relationship here. She needs to be able to come to Canaan. And so he, he gives this servant the mission. The servant makes this oath. He agrees to go. And so then we arrive at the second scene of this story, verses 10 to 28, where we see a meeting. In verse 10, look at what the text says. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. So he travels to the region that Abraham is broadly from. And he gets there and he stops at a well. And wells were really your standard rest stop in the desert. If, if you're on a trip and, and you're on a road trip with a car, right, you need to stop pretty frequently at a gas station. If you're traveling through the desert, if you're traveling with a bunch of camels, you need to stop for a lot of water. So the well was really your standard desert stopping place. And the servant gets there and he stops and he prays. And, and it's interesting. We don't really know a lot about the servant. We don't know how much he knew about God. But, but he knows that Abraham's God has blessed Abraham. He knows he's been kind to him. And so he asks him for help. Look at verse 12. Servant says, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Show steadfast love to my master Abraham. In, the, in this prayer, he introduces this term, which is really central in this story, and that's the, this term, steadfast love. This is a concept that shows up four times throughout this chapter, here in verse 12, and then in 14, and then a little bit later in 27 and 49. And, and steadfast love here is, it's the Hebrew term hesed, hesed, which, which means steadfast love or kindness, loving kindness. Um, it, it, it refers to the loyalty that you show to those that you're in relationship with, that, that you've made a covenant with this sort of faithful 
loyal love. And it's this really key attribute of describing God in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew Scriptures. In Exodus 34, God gives this really famous summary statement about his character, who he is. And this is what he says. He says, The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He's abounding in it. It's really central to who he is. The, this concept, Hesed, it's, it's the loyal love that God shows to his people, and then that his people are meant to show to each other. Hesed. You know, there's, there's this classic film, which is sort of famous for making people cry in the first 10 minutes. Uh, it's the Pixar movie, Up. And, and loyalty, this sort of loyal love, is actually a key theme in this movie. It's a movie about an older man named Carl Fredrickson. Maybe some of you have seen it, but Carl Fredrickson, he, he sort of closes himself off to the world a little bit after his wife passes away. But then he decides to go on, on one last adventure, sort of the adventure they always dreamed of. And, and he decides to float his house to South America with a bunch of helium balloons. Um, but along the way, things get a little bit complicated when a kid named Russell accidentally stows away on his front porch and sort of ac like accidentally shanghai <laughs> on his little balloon house. And they, so they arrive in South America, right? And here we get into very classic animated movie cartoon fashion. The kid Russell befriends a giant bird and a talking dog. <laughs> and sort of the crazy plot twist is that the talking dog's master is actually trying to hunt the giant bird and its family. So some, some tension is introduced into the plot. Um, but, but this kid, Russell, he, he asks Mr. Fredrickson to promise that he'll help protect the bird. You've got you've to not leave the bird. You've got to protect it. And, and Mr. Fredrickson promises. And the climax of the movie is Mr. Fredrickson realizing in this moment that, that even when it's going to cost him something, he can't go back on his promise. He can't go back on his promise. And so he, he shows loyal love to this kid, Russell, because of his promise, because of his relationship that he has with him. He, he holds fast to his promise. And, and this is just this little picture uh, of this sort of idea uh, of this loyalty or this steadfast love that the servant in our text today is calling on God to show. He says, hey God, you've made a promise. You've, you've made this covenant. You have this relationship with Abraham. Don't quit on your love for those that you're in relationship with. God, I need you to provide. And so the servant proposes this test, this way that he, he hopes God would show who the right person is. He, he sort of proposes this outlandish act of hospitality. Look at verses 13 to 14. This is the servant praying to God. He says, Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, Please, let down your jar that I may drink. And who shall say, Drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. So he takes this pretty common cultural practice to offer water to a traveler. That was, that was sort of standard fare. Think a little bit like being in New Jersey and not having to pump your own gas. It's sort of standard cultural practice, this natural ask of hospitality that was expected. And he takes that, and in his test, he sort of turns it up to 11. So the text tells us that the servant has 10 camels. And I... I was doing some research about camels. I, I didn't necessarily know this, but a thirsty camel can down like 10 gallons of water in just a matter of minutes. So we're talking like hundreds of gallons of water that, that he, he's proposing that God would bring the right person who, who would go above and beyond so much that they would, they, they would draw just hundreds of gallons of water for him and all of his camels. And, and that is something that wouldn't just naturally happen. And so that would be the way that he would know that it's the right person. 
Um, I, during grad school, I used to work at a coffee shop. I worked there for a few years, and there'd be times where we would get shipments of milk, at, you know, you need for lattes and things like that at a coffee shop. And we probably got 20 gallons of milk at a time, something like that. But that was enough that, like, we would try to pass it off to the next person. That, loading all the, the milk that showed up into the fridge wasn't something that we wanted to do. So to, to draw just hundreds and hundreds of gallons of water isn't something that someone should naturally do on their own. And so it, it's this indication that, that God would be in the works behind the scene. That, that's the test that the servant proposes. The, this unique thing to offer. And the narrative, the way the story moves here is pretty amazing. Verse 15, it says, before he had finished speaking, he's praying. Before he even finishes his prayer, behold, Rebecca. Rebecca shows up and the text describes her as, it says she's attractive. It basically says she's eligible and she's hospitable. She, she goes above and beyond to offer water for the servant and then All of his camels shows this really outlandish act of hospitality to a stranger. And the servant, he's just stunned speechless. He doesn't know what to do. Verse 21, the man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. And then he starts to realize that, yes, this is is God in the works here. And so he praises God for not quitting on his steadfast love. That's what we see here is that God doesn't quit on his love. We we see the character of God here. God is a God who doesn't quit on his promises. He's a God who doesn't quit on his love. God is faithful to those that he's committed himself to. And and the challenges of, of a new generation the next set of problems that come up in this world aren't too hard for him. Even in the midst of a a rapidly changing world, God is still faithful. He's still kind. In the midst of all the challenges of our particular moment in this time in history, in in the midst of a world being shaped by technology, quicker than we can understand the way it's affecting our lives. In the midst of mental health crises and loneliness, in the midst of fears about the future, in a culture that is disinterested in God, God is still the God who's abounding in steadfast love. That's still true. He's still faithful. He hasn't stopped being loving. He hasn't stopped being kind. He's the God who who continues on to the next generation throughout history. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Our God is, is the loving provider who keeps his promises to you and to me, to his people. And if any of those those challenges, those fears ring true at all, or if there's just other challenges that you're facing where, where you don't know where God's at, it feels like you, you've been waiting for him to show up and you're not sure why he hasn't. You need him to provide. I want to encourage you with, with the example we see in this text to, to pray to him and as you pray to really hold him to his promises. To, to pray and say, God, you, you've promised to be loving, to be kind. I'm, I'm not sure where you're doing that here, but God, would you be faithful to your steadfast love to me? And, and as you pray, would you remember that he's the God who hears prayers before we even, even finish praying them. Before we even finish praying them, he's with us and he hears us. He's the God who provides, who doesn't quit on his love. So what we see here, God provides. Rebecca shows up. And and then the servant asks to meet her family. And in that, we get sort of the transition to the last scene in this text, uh, a marriage. We see a marriage in these final verses is arranged and then takes place. In verse 29, the servant goes to Rebecca's household. He meets her family, and we're introduced to her brother named Laban. 
And it's really interesting. Look how Laban greets the servant in verse 31. He says, come in, O blessed of the Lord. This affirmation that the servant, who we still don't know a ton about, this, this story really doesn't give us a lot about him, but we get this interesting affirmation that, that the servant is also a recipient of blessing. And, and the servant comes in, he, he tells a story, and, and he talks about how God has blessed Abraham, how in his old age he's blessed him with a son, and how he, as Abraham's servant, has now been sent because that son needs a wife. He sort of tells his backstory. And then in verses 37 to 48, he really recounts the, full, the whole first half of the chapter up to now. His conversation with Abraham, how he asked God to show a wife, and then how he met with Rebekah at the well. He, he brings the family up to speed on everything that happens. And then he concludes his story by saying, let me know what you're thinking now, basically, in verse 49. Now, now then, if you're going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or the left. So sort of let me know what you're thinking. It's, it's a little bit of the arranged marriage version of like a define the relationship talk. Like, I need to know what you're thinking here. Let, let, let me know which way you're leaning. Um, and, and we see that Rebecca's family agrees to the marriage. And we sort of have to adjust our, our historical perspective, our, our, our cultural sensibilities a little bit. Some of our modern Western instincts about what romance and marriage are supposed to look like might be a little bit uh, weirded out here. Uh, but, but it is worth noting, look at verse 58, that, that ultimately when Rebecca's family suggests she stays 10 more days, that, that she makes the decision to leave. She wants to go. She's ready to go. And so we sort of head to the conclusion of this text as Rebecca returns with the servant to Canaan. And then her and Isaac are married. Verse 67 says, Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebecca, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So they're married, and God has been shown to provide. He's provided. He's faithful to his promises. And it's really interesting what we see in this last scene is not only that. Not only is God faithful to his promises, but the promises of God are expansive. What we see here is that the pool of recipients of the promises of blessing, keep expanding. So we know that Abraham was blessed, but, but now the servant is also described as blessed. Just because of his connection to Abraham, the, this unnamed servant is also a recipient generation as well. He's, he's faithful and blesses Isaac. Because God's promises and God's purposes aren't limited to one generation. They're not limited to, to one age demographic or, or one particular moment of history. No, they're carried on. God says, I was faithful to Abraham and I'll be faithful to Isaac too. It's not possible be, to be too young for God to be interested in you or too old for God to be interested in you. No, God's promises are multi-generational. Do you believe that? God's promises are for all people. What we, what we see here is that the promises of God aren't limited by gender either. This is really significant. Rebecca makes this decision to join into the covenant family. And then immediately the text shows us that she is now also a recipient of the covenant blessing. Look at verse 60. So she makes this decision to, to go with the servant, to go back. She's about to leave. And then her family blesses her, says, they blessed Rebecca and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. So we, we get this language which like takes us back 
to chapter 12 and chapter 15 of Genesis when Abraham first was given his promises of blessing. She's, she's given a promise that she's going to have numerous offspring and that those who, who oppose her would be opposed, that they would be cursed. This clear echo to the Abrahamic covenant is now applied to Rebekah as she joins into the family of God. And so Rebecca becomes this sort of daughter-in-law of the promise, this full participant in the promises of God. And God's promise to Abraham, the original promise that he made that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through you, all the nations of the earth, it makes this small step forward, and then it keeps moving forward. And then it keeps moving forward until finally, because of God's promise to bless all the nations of the earth, all the peoples of the earth, because of God's love for the world, because he loved the world so much, he sends his son, who's born from this line of promise. And all the promises are, are wrapped up in him. They're wrapped up in Christ, the Son of God, who's born from the line of promise, the Savior who, who died and, and rose to new life and then offers new life through the Spirit of God, which is poured out on all flesh, on, on every type of person, all peoples, young and old, from all around the world. The promises of God are expansive. So that then in Galatians 3, the Apostle Paul writes, In Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God or, or children of God. How? He says, you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Look at this. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So not only do God's promises continue, they expand. They expand to all people who are joined into this family of God by faith. And so as we join into Christ, we can become heirs of God's original promises to Abraham. Not only do God's promises continue, they expand. And so if you've ever felt, or if for some reason you've ever been told that the promises of God aren't for you. I want you to see here today the expansive nature of the promises of God, the expansive nature of God's promises. God gives his blessing and he gives his salvation with expansive force like an earthquake. It's a shock wave which radiates out in all directions and breaks down walls as it goes. His promises break down the walls that people and societies build up in order to divide and exclude. And he freely offers the loyal love of close relationship to the very people who aren't interested in him. The message of the gospel is that it's the very people who are against God that he makes heirs according to his promise as they turn to him in faith. His love can't be stopped. His kindness has no end. And so in these last few minutes today, I want to invite you to consider what would it look like to trust a God like that? To trust that God is actually kind. To trust in my life that God is faithful to his promises. What would it look like for me to trust a God like that with my future? What would it look like to trust a God like that with my family? To, to really believe and really live like I believe that his purposes are good. That his promises can't be stopped. That he is the God who is abounding in steadfast love and in faithfulness.
Would you pray with me? God, we, we thank you for this story that you've given us in your word. And God, we thank you for your promises, which can't be stopped. God, we, we thank you that your promises of blessing started with Abraham and keep moving forward. God, we pray that you would help us today to, to turn to you in faith, to believe the things that you've told us about yourself, that you are a God full of love and faithfulness and kindness and loyalty to those who are your own. God, I pray that these truths would sink deep into the hearts of everyone here and reshape our lives in trust that you are good. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing a, a new song to our church that talks of God's steadfast love and the blessed assurance that we have um, and a God that's faithful to his promises. So let's stand as we sing in response. Be. Mm-hmm. 
you go with would you go with these closing words of benediction from Lamentations chapter three? Uh, if ever ever there was a group of people who had a, a right to question whether or not God continues on His loyal love, is He really hold fast to His promises? It was the people who wrote the book of Lamentations. Hear what they say. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Would you go in peace? Amen.